My name is Carol Michelson. I'm a curator of Chinese jade in the Department of Asia at the British Museum. I helped to set up this gallery in 2002 when due to the generosity of Sir Joseph Hotung, whose jades form the basis of the gallery contents, and the generosity also of Ellie and Selwyn Elaine, two patrons of the British Museum who paid for the renovation of the gallery. Um, the gallery was um, inaugurated. In 2016, we closed the gallery, and again, due to the generosity of Sir Joseph Hotong, we renovated it, and it reopened with the Queen opening it on November the 8th, 2017. When we were setting up the Gallery of Chinese Jade, what I particularly wanted to show was a chronological display of Chinese Jade. Chinese jade has been revered by the Chinese for at least seven or 8,000 years. They were one of the first people to work it in the world and have continuously revered it for all that time. And though, although other cultures have also um, venerated jade, never have they done so for as long a time as the Chinese had. And even today, when I show Chinese people around the Chinese jade gallery, most ladies will either have a Chinese jade bangle or a Chinese pendant around their neck. And many gentlemen will have a little pebble in their pockets that they can rub it. And it's a sort of um, a help against um, misfortune, possible misfortune or bad luck. It's a, a really good thing to have on you. So the very beginning of the exhibition, I wanted to show what jade was, because most people don't know what jade looks like in the raw. So I borrowed a piece of nephrite jade from the Natural History Museum, which is this piece over here. But we also wanted to show the fact that jade is a generic term that incorporates both jadeite and nephrite, two very different minerals, but both called jade, both called jade in the Western languages, but also in Chinese, both are called yu. So this is nephrite jade, and this one here is jadeite jade. And so is this piece here, and you can see that the colouring of jadeite jade is very different from the colouring of nephrite jade, which tends to be greens and browns and yellows. Here we see a very bright green, and that is caused by chromium in the mineral. Um, here we have a very lavender-like effect, um, which is also characteristic of jadeite jade. However, Chinese have traditionally really only used nephrite jade until the 18th century. There are very few examples of jadeite jade before the 18th century AD, and it was at that time that um, the Qianlong Emperor, who reigned from 1736 to 1795, conquered Zungaria, had access then to both the um, nephrite producing areas of, of Central Asia, but also conducted a treaty with the Burmese. And from the Burmese, he got jadeite. And he loved it, and he had a lot of jades made in jadeite. But we don't have many jadeite pieces in this gallery. We have, in fact, only two, and I'll point them out as we go. One of the great problems about jade is that it is very difficult to date. It's a mineral, so you can't date it by thermoluminescence or carbon-14, as you can with, say, ceramics for thermoluminescence or organic material with carbon-14. And so one of our researchers in our world-famous scientific research department at the British Museum, Margaret Sachs, has been doing some groundbreaking work on trying to look at tool marks on jades under very high magnification and then to establish a chronology of tool working. And this is one of the ways forward in which we might be able to date jades in the future. And this case here shows you some of the work she's been doing, including um, x-raying things like this jade sung here, this tall tube, where you can see that the um, Neolithic people who were working it were about to miss when they were working it from both ends and then realised at the last moment they were going to miss, so got out a smaller bore to finish it off. And it's um, details like this that help us to understand how jade was worked in the past. 
This is the beginning of the chronological display of Chinese jade in the gallery. And the earliest jades, dating from around 5000 BC, were found in tombs and include ornaments, ceremonial tools, and weapons. The earliest culture that we really know anything about is the Hongshan culture, but we do have some earlier jades that predate that. And you can see from the great sophistication of this shoehorn-shaped jade here, which comes from the northeast, from Inner Mongolia on Liaoning province, um, that jade working must have begun long before this in order for them to be able to produce such sophisticated jade at such an early time. The Hongshan culture is renowned for its pig dragons. Um, and you can see here a jade which is curved. It's got a hole through it. It must have been a pendant. It's got a pig head and a snake-like body. They also had birds, they also had hair ornaments, and you can see in the illustrations we've got by the side how the hair ornament was placed under the head of the body in the grave and presumably held the ponytail that the person must have been wearing um, dragged through the hair ornament, which would have been much too heavy to have worn in life. The Hongshan culture was about 4,700 to 2,900 BC. And the next major culture that we know about that was um, very much working jade was that of the Liangzhu. And whereas the Hongshan were up in the northeast of China, the Liangzhu were down in the southeast of China, and their dates were roughly 3,300 to 2,100 BC. And here we have some of the jades that were um, in typical Liangzhu um, graves, and that includes the quintessential jades of the Liangzhu, which were the bee and the sung. The bee was placed on the chest of the people who were dead, in, lying in the grave, and the sung were placed around the um, body, aligning the body in the grave, and we can see that better illustrated in a moment. And we have a good illustration of it just here there is a, a very distinctive mask which you find mask-like face on a lot of the, the shorter song such as you can see on this illustration here where there's a man with a feathered headdress with his arms akimbo grabbing some sort of monster-like figure below who's got fierce looking eyes nose mouth fang whatever there were also many bracelets, and in fact, in a Liangzhu grave, you might have found up to 300 jades um, lying in the grave. So it was something that shows how sophisticated society must have been at that time. The fact that the people who made these jades, and these jades might have taken forever to work. For instance, the long sung, about 49 centimetres high, probably took two years, three years to work. They would have only had something like bamboo at their disposal, around which they would have to put some sort of slurry. And then two people, because one of the characteristics of Liangzhu um, jades is that they were worked from two ends. So these two people would have to sit down and just grind away and away and away. Because you cannot carve jade, although we talk about carving jade, you actually have to abrade it. It's too hard to carve. And in fact, if you can scratch jade with metal, it isn't jade. It's a, one of the softer hemi-semi jades. Some of the 300 odd jades that you might have found in a Liangzhu grave include necklaces of beads and these awls which might have been partly incorporated into the necklaces and wonderful axe fittings. And one of the most precious jades in this particular section is this number 16 where the um, drawing on the jade is exquisitely um, intricate and might well have signified perhaps some sort of um, decoration that was particular to one um, family. But that's speculation because the fact is this is a Neolithic society, there is no writing that they've left behind, and so we can only speculate from what we find in their graves. And this is meant to show you something about, um, uh, to, this is meant to show you an illustration of how the bodies would have been laid in the grave with these jades on top of them, with the B, the circular disc with the central hole, um, laid out on the center and the stomach of the person in the grave, and then the sung going round 
the actual body. And then in what we think are only male graves um, are axes coming out at the side. Axes are, of course, one of the quintessential tools of any Neolithic society. And what you find with the Chinese is that they started to make some of them in jade um, to show, perhaps, that they were not meant to be used uh, as utilitarian tools, but as something special, perhaps something for, uh, that could be used in a ceremonial or a ritual um, role. One of the most beautiful axes we have is this one here, which is a long shang axe, and it's got a wonderful face pattern on it, though it's probably quite difficult to see um, through the glass, but it's very beautifully um, etched into the jade. And the two colors of the blade are quite different, which is um, very interesting and possibly due to the way in which it was buried. This is a wonderful implement down here, and you can see that it was never meant to be practically used, as the holes are much too far apart to have been practical. If you'd hafted it, um, it would have broken. So this was obviously meant to be something that was used in a ceremonial way. And we do have the examples of little tiny bronze figures, which were found dating to about 1200 BC, where the little bronze figures are holding up what appears to be a jade scepter or jade axe. And this would have been used in some sort of ritual um, performance. We now leave behind the Neolithic period and go into the period of what the Chinese call San Dai. That's the Xia Dynasty, the Shang Dynasty, and the Zhou Dynasty. And the one for which we have um, most uh, archaeological um, evidence is the, is the earliest is the Shang Dynasty from about 1500 to 850 BC. And during the Shang Dynasty, there was one particularly famous grave that's been discovered that belonged to somebody called Fu Hao, who died about 1200 BC and who was buried in Anyang, the last of the Shang Dynasty capitals. And although her tomb had been robbed, it still had in it 750 jades and over 468 bronzes when it was discovered. And she was merely the queen, or possibly even only a concubine, of one of the Shang Dynasty kings. So it's tantalizing to think what treasures might have been found in the other royal graves that had been very much worse robbed. But jade was always a very precious material. It took a long time to work, it was very tough. Um, therefore, it was very much prized, and if it broke, then you would tend to try and reuse it if you possibly could. And this panel here is showing you how some jades might well have been reused. So we have number one here, which is the corner of a tsung, one of those tall, long tubes. Um, and here there have been holes um, made into it so they can be worn as a pendant. And number two is possibly um, part of the remnant of one of the Hongshan comb-like ornaments that date back to 4700 BC, probably broken at some time in the Neolithic period, found again in the Shang Dynasty in about 1500 BC, and reworked again into a pendant shape. So here with number eight, you can see how a, a ring that probably dates to the late Neolithic period, early Shang, has got a bronze um, mend. Um, so during the Bronze Age, they managed to um, put that together again. As I said, Fu Hao was one of the most amazing um, women ever to have lived in Chinese history because we know from the oracle bone scripts of the time that she actually went into battle on behalf of her people and her husband. She conducted peace treaties on their behalf and she obviously loved jade. She had jades made at her um, home at Anyang by craftsmen who were copying some Neolithic jades. And she had some Neolithic jades in her tomb. So she had some Hongshang jades. Um, she had some Shudia He jades. And she copied them in the Shang idiom. And if you look at number four to the right, this is a copy of the Hongshan pig dragon we saw earlier on, but now made with the little um, notches in it, which was typical of the Shang Dynasty period, and sort of Shang um, Dynasty bronze-style decoration. 
And gradually, during the late Shang, the early Western Zhou, Western Zhou being um, 1050 BC down to 770 BC, people began to increasingly wear a series of pendants so that they would be covered from the neck to the knees in jade pendants when they were buried in uh, the ground after death. And we come to accept that this was possibly because they had an association in their mind between jade being an incorruptible material, very hard material, and that therefore if they covered the body in this hard material in death, it would stop the body from disintegrating and keep it um, whole so that it could enjoy the afterlife. So here we have a series of um, pendant pieces that would have made up part of these complicated pendants that went from the neck to the knees. And here you can see some birds, some reptiles, some, um, a tiger eating a fish, which is number 14, which is quite an unusual piece there, some rabbits, um, some deer, some flying um, human-like figures, and some fish, which we've sort of shown jumping out of the water, plus two little figures, um, which uh, were quite rare at this stage, of Western Joe figures um, with their hats on and showing the sort of robes that were worn at that time. So here in the late Western Joe and early Eastern Joe, we can see um, a picture of how jade pendants and beads were found in the grave, in the archaeological um, uh, find. And over the face, they would have placed um, a textile and then they would have sewn onto the textile little jade pieces that would have represented the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the eyebrows. And you can see that very clearly, even though the textile has itself disintegrated, but you can still see where the facial pieces were in the grave and the long pendant sets that covered the rest of the body. We have some wonderful pendant pieces here. You can see this um, bead number five with a very complicated um, pattern on it, which we've actually blown up on the label here. Um, and these patterns were very beautifully um, um, engraved onto the jade material. They also continued to use B. And here you can see two pieces belonging to the Eastern Zhou. And um, the Eastern Zhou went from 770 BC down to 221 BC. And they have the most amazing polish. And in fact, a lot of people will say that some of the best jades that were ever made date to this Eastern Zhou period and through the Qin and the Han dynasty. So from roughly 770 BC down to 220 AD. And that even in the Qing dynasty, which was 1644 down to 1911, they never although they made exceptionally accomplished jades, they didn't have perhaps the soul that those pieces that belonged to the, this particular earlier period did. And you can see the wonderful sheen, and you have to understand that every one of the bumps on these two um, B would have had to been abraded, that you have to wear away the J behind the bump in order to make it stand out in 3D relief. And to have done it with such even lines is just an amazing feat, even today, with today's technology. So we have to have huge admiration for the J craftsmen of this time. Again, pendant pieces were very important, and we can see some of the pendant pieces here, and again here with some more beads with the beautiful decorations on them. And um, these um, circular pieces and these semicircular huang, which would also have been um, part of pendant pieces, as would this matching pair of dragons, probably sliced from one piece of jade. And the dragon, uh, being a very important animal in Chinese um, uh, culture, and unlike the dragon in the West, where we have to send St. George out to kill it because it's a bad, evil animal. In China, the dragon has always been auspicious. And um, because it's been associated with the bringing of rain, it's always been associated with fertility, and therefore with definitely it was a benevolent animal and something that could be um, cherished and worshipped. So this is a very beautiful pair of matching jade pendants of dragons, which probably would have belonged to somebody very senior in um, the hierarchy of Chinese society.
And animals uh, are uh, very important in Chinese art. And here we have a series of jade animals, which I divided up according to chronology. So this first block here consists of animals dating to the Han Dynasty. And we have a little bear there, and bears were particularly popular in the Han Dynasty. And down on this lower shelf here, we show the... Um, how, how one medium might well have influenced another. So we have what would have been a, probably a bronze weight um, being copied in the jade. Weights were used very frequently in bronze and in jade at this time because the Chinese, until the Tang Dynasty, which is 618 to 906 AD, were not sitting on chairs. So um, before the Tang Dynasty, they were sitting on mats rather like tatami mats in Japan today. And so you needed to weight the mats down in order to keep them on the ground. So weights like this were very commonly used. This um, middle section is um, animals from the Tang Dynasty, including this wonderful dog with the spine very clearly delineated there, and a horse and a camel. This buffalo um, dates to the late Qing Dynasty. And this pair of mandarin ducks uh, dates to the 18th century and mandarin ducks were seen in China as representing marital fidelity because apparently in China the mandarin duck only mates once and for life. But one of the jades in this section here is particularly interesting, number 15, because he was um, brought into the British Museum in 1973 and um, was uh, accession by the museum as a Han Dynasty bear, Han Dynasty being 206 BC to AD 220. But when we were um, working on jades and Jessica Rawson um, particularly studied this jade, Jessica Rawson being one of the great gurus of Chinese jade um, in the West, she just um, thought that in fact it was more likely to be a Ming Dynasty copy of a Han Dynasty jade. And when Margaret Sachs, our scientific researcher, looked at the jade under very high magnification, she could tell that a lot of the brown, which we had thought was the skin of the jade, was in fact dye. And that dyeing of jades, to make them look more ancient, was something that was particularly practiced in the Ming Dynasty, which is 1368 to 1644. So this little bear here, who used to be down there with the Han Dynasty animals, is now moved over to the right and has joined the Ming and the Qing section. So this case um, shows cases some of the pieces that would have been used in um, for sword accessories and thumb rings for archery. And these were very important accomplishments of a gentleman in the Qin and Han Dynasty period and um, for other periods as well. And some of them have got the most beautiful polish on them, um, like number four, the thumb ring there. And these are sword shapes for putting on the end of the sword. And here we show the influence between um, the Central Asian steps and their use of gold, which is something that had not been particularly prized by the Chinese, who particularly worshipped jade and bronzes, and gold and silver and diamonds had not been part of the hierarchy of their valuable materials. But you can see the influence of gold coming in from the steppe, and the, also the influence of belt parks, because the Chinese, in order to fight the nomads who occupied the western steppes and who were forever making incursions into Chinese territory for the luxuries that their nomadic way of life couldn't provide, um, they uh, had to wear trousers uh, to fight on horses. And so the Chinese then had to use trousers as well and then started to need to use belt hooks to keep up their trousers. So belt hooks became an increasingly popular accessory for the Chinese of this time. And here we have a very beautiful Chinese belt hook made of gilt bronze inlaid with glass beads and also broken bits of jade. Again, another use of reusing jade so that it shouldn't be wasted even though it had broken. Here we have um, a layout of how a Han Dynasty burial might have been with those who were 
very high up in the hierarchy, entitled to a jade suit. We don't have a jade suit in the British Museum, but this is a picture of one that was buried in about 113 BC up in the very north of China. It would have taken about 10 years to make, so it was a very precious item. And there are only about 50 suits of jade suits in China today. But for those who couldn't afford, who weren't allowed to have a jade suit, they would put cicadas on the tongue because cicadas is redolent of resurrection. They put pieces in the shape of their eyes on their eyes and they would put pieces of jade up their nostrils and in their ears and in the other bodily orifices. They'd also have jade B. So jade B was still being used from 5000 BC down to this period in the Han Dynasty in about um, um, BC 206 to AD 220, these jades would be placed on the chest of the body in the grave and the hands might well have held pigs because pigs were signs of fertility, a favourite food for the Chinese and something um, that they particularly cherished and would like to have in the afterlife. Also at this time, glass began to be made by the Chinese. They weren't particularly good glass makers because they didn't need to be because they were superb bronze jade and lacquer and other materials. But they did start to make glass because they were actually intrigued by it. And one of the things you can tell about Chinese glass is that it's got a constituency of barium lead, whereas Western glass it tends to be soda and lime. And that's possibly because it ended up green. And it's very possible that the green of the glass was what, um, of the barium lead mixture, is what led them to make glass like that. And then they would use it as a substitute for jade. And the way that the first emperor, who had these terracotta warriors, and of course terracotta is quite a fragile material, but the idea was that it would look so realistic and um, lifelike that they would actually be as effective as they needed to be in the afterlife. So the green glass, looking like green jade, would be as hard as the jade itself in the afterlife. So this is where the, the gallery breaks to the extent that the earlier part of the jades in the gallery belong to what we call the archaic period. And from now on, from 206 BC or later Chinese jades as we call them to the present day, are um, jades of the later period in Chinese chronology. So here we have um, examples of jades that might have been worn by ladies of the Tang Dynasty period, Tang Dynasty period being 618 to 906 AD. Here you see a lady with wonderful headdresses and also jade pendants coming down from her waist. Possibly those were to actually stop the, the dresses um, flying out in the wind, so it was a modesty measure. For men, the jade belt was the quint, uh, quintessential accessory, and you were only allowed to wear jade if you were of a certain rank in the hierarchy. Chinese do not have pockets in their robes, so actually suspending accoutrements from the jade belts was a very essential uh, uh, element. And you can see the holes in the jade belt plaques from which things like knives um, and eventually snuff bottles in a later period would have been actually suspended. And here we have a variety of jade plaques that could have made up one of those um, jade belt sets there. We have a jade buckle, we have a jade hook here, and here we have two hair ornaments because the Chinese men used to wear their hair long and on top of their head and then used to have a, a little jade, if you were entitled to wear jade, a little jade um, cap to, or knob to actually put over the, the hair on your head. So these eventually were not needed because in the Qing dynasty, the last imperial dynasty of China from 1644 to 1911, the men were required by the Manchu dynasty to wear their hair in a plait down their back. So a lot of these jade hair ornaments became the knobs of archaistic bronzes. But here we have a pair of earrings dating to the Tang dynasty and these are flying apsaras. These are Buddhist angels. And these are other pieces that might have been sewn onto robes or used as decoration or used as pendants. Number 24 is a Kangxi pendant. Kangxi who reigned from 1662 to 1722. And then number 25 is a modern 1998 plaque in 
sort of looking back to the past and producing something out of reverence for the past um, type of jade. 28 is also a, a modern piece that I bought in 1998, which is very beautifully carved. So now we're starting to look at vessels in the um, later uh, period. And here we have a Tang Dynasty vessel. And as I said, because it's impossible to date jade scientifically at this moment, we tend to do it stylistically. And because this jade lobed um, vessel is very similar to Sasanian and Tang Dynasty metal vessels, we date this to the Tang Dynasty. And we date this little basket weave type decorated bowl to the Sung dynasty because we have basket weave silver bowls and also dingware ceramic bowls in that sort of pattern, um, very commonly found in the Sung dynasty. Here we have a plate that dates to the Liao dynasty, which is very similar to Liao dynasty um, lobed objects of that time. This is one of the two jadeite pieces in the British um, Museum's Chinese jade gallery. As I said, there are only two pieces of jadeite in this gallery. Um, this one is a loan from another collection, and it's an arrow vase that is a small copy of an antique bronze, which was part of um, a gambling game that the Chinese um, commonly play called Pitch Pot, which goes back to about 600 BC. Here we have some items which are copying in porcelain. This little box here, number six, with a beautiful pattern of a bird on a bough, um, looks just like a ceramic box would have done at that period, which is um, Qing Dynasty. And also we have here a beautiful pair of matching jade bowls, absolutely plain, completely undecorated, showing off the purity of the jade color. And here we have a, a set of sweet meat plates, which are so beautifully put together that they have to be um, set in the order in which they are now. And on the back of each plate is a number written with the check system of numbers in Chinese. And unless you put them together in that order, they don't fit together perfectly. So these items here are copying lacquer. This box here is copying a lacquer box of the time, and this little box here with lychees on it is copying, as you can see, this lacquer box with lychees very beautifully depicted on it there. But we also wanted to show the influence um, during the Qing dynasty uh, that um, Mughal jade um, and foreign influences had on Chinese jade. The Qianlong emperor, um, conquered Zongaria in the 1750s, which meant that he then had access right across Central Asia to Khotan, where the best nephrite has come from and where Chinese has got its jade from since the end of the Neolithic period. And so these jades are either Mughal jades or Chinese pieces copying Mughal jades because the Qianlong emperors loved them so much that he had a workshop set up in the Chinese court in Beijing to actually copy the Chinese jades from the Mughal period. He said, in fact, that some of the Chinese ones couldn't be made as thinly as the Mughal ones, which he deprecated, but some of them are very beautifully made, such as this little bowl here, where you can see the floral decoration on it, very typical of Mughal-style decoration. Snuff bottles. Snuff came into China sometime um, in the 17th century and became a very popular um, pastime for the rich of the Chinese. And here we have our second jadeite piece in the, mu in the gallery, which is this little snuff bottle here with a, a rose agate top, but a beautiful color green. And this very lovely nephrite jade snuff bottle there with a little coral um, stopper to it. Chinese um, snuff was something that became a very popular pastime for the Chinese. So now we have um, some um, jades that are copying archaic bronzes. So they're looking back to the bronzes. And 
Confucius said that the time when China was ruled probably at its best was at the beginning of the Zhou dynasty, when the Duke of Zhou ruled as regent for his nephew. And then when his nephew came of age, he stepped aside, which was just how it should have been. And the, the country was ruled and was very peaceably um, ruled. And there was hardly any crime. And so people tended to look back um, to the great bronzes that were made at that time. They would never have been copied in jade at that time either. It's only at this latter time when they were copying older bronzes that they then tended to use jade also to, to look back to the great bronzes of earlier times. So this bronze, the, sorry, so this jade here is copying an archaic bronze, as is that cup with two handles there and probably that vase behind there. Then there's the auspicious quality of a lot of jade. And so here we have a wonderful marriage bowl where you have two fish, and fish in Chinese is yu, and abundance is yu. So therefore, having two fish on a bowl, um, and it would have been very difficult to have carved those, have braided those um, fish on a bowl with the interior relatively small of that size. Um, but this would have been a marriage bowl to give to a couple on their wedding. Here we have two Buddhist pieces as well, um, two Buddhist law han, and these are basically copying um, woodblock prints. Um, very carefully, you can see the script on the law han at the back there, um, and that would have been on the, the script that would have been run the woodblock print in the print itself. The Chinese carp that we have here was bought by myself and a number of friends of somebody called Yang Kit So, who was a world-renowned cookery expert, a friend of the British Museum, and she used the carp as her logo on her cookery books. So we bought that carp in her honor. And this four shou, which is the Buddha's hand, which was, is copying a Chinese citrus fruit, which actually, when cut open, has a very lovely smell. And so you can put it into pomanders and put it into drawers to um, make the drawer content smell very pleasantly. And this is the Chinese um, version of it, and um, very beautifully made. The last case bit here is just to um, highlight the fact that jade has been revered by the Chinese for probably seven or 8,000 years now. But it is still being revered by the Chinese. And um, since about 1970, um, the Chinese jade industry has been revived. And although it's not probably to father to son and a family run business in the way it might have been in the past, there are some very, very talented jade carvers who are working in China today. Interestingly, they work in the same centers as the ancient Chinese um, jades were worked, such as Suzhou, Shanghai, um, and Yangzhou. Yangzhou particularly specialized in boulders. And these were five jades that I went with Margaret Sachs to China, and we bought them in um, 2017, having looked at the um, various jade work craft shops over the last few years. This one is a beautiful landscape um, carving made by somebody called Yang Shi from Suzhou. And here he's showing um, sort of concrete houses, but also a traditional bridge, a little tiny boat underneath the bridge, and ginkgo leaves falling down the actual um, landscape and cut right through. And if you just imagine how, if when you were working it, you have to be so careful not to break the very, very delicate stem of the ginkgo leaf. So really exquisitely made. And this is a, a wonderful pendant by Jai Yi Wei, um, focusing on two men within um, a grove. And here again, it's looking back to the pendants of Kang Shi. Um, and showing that looking back to the past and archaism is still something that's very much prized in China. As you can see from this archaistic jade, which is by Ma Hongwei, and he has made this jade in reverence for the shape of the bronzes of the uh, Shang and Zhou period. 
This is a teapot by Yu Ting, and um, this is wafer thin. So I put a light, a cold light, underneath the bottom of it, so you can see just how paper thin the actual body of the jade is. And that would have been really complicated to do, even with the modern technology available to the Chinese carvers today. And then this little pot four, which is an incense pot and possibly also a funneling piece, is um, a piece by Yang Guang, and it's got a screw lid. And to do a screw lid in jade, even again with the modern tools available, is still something that's very complicated. So we're very pleased to be able to show in this chronological display of Chinese jade that Chinese jade is still as much admired and revered as it was in the past. And we have one Chinese jade piece in the main gallery in the new 21st century case that was instituted when the gallery was reworked last year. This case is focusing on objects that would have been placed on the scholar's table um, and also to show how the Chinese carvers of the 18th century AD were able to take a 2D picture and actually work it onto a 3D surface, which is truly amazing. What we put here are two images from a, um, a famous um, agriculture and sericulture manual called the Gangja II. And this is an imperial edition that we have in the British Museum that dates to 1696. And here you can see two scenes, one of which has got a hayrick with a ladder and people talking to the person at the top of the hayrick. And you can see that scene duplicated on the brush pot here with the ladder and the hayrick. So it's very beautifully depicted how they could take this 2D picture and transpose it onto a curved surface. We have this beautiful brush pot here, which uh, would have also sat on the scholar's table. A wrist rest, which is an essential accoutrement for the Chinese calligrapher as he rests his wrist on a wrist rest as he's practicing his calligraphy. A brush washer in which to wash the brushes and then some table screens. Um, very commonly, um, Chinese scholars tended to have pictures of rustic scenes that they wished were going to wish themselves into for when they had finished being um, a bureaucrat and a civil servant and worked hard all their life. They were dreaming of retiring to a rural retreat such as this with pine trees and mountains and streams where they could go and drink wine, write poetry, play the chin and discuss antiques with fellow um, Chinese retirees. So this would have sat on the scholar's desk and provided inspiration for him while he worked. And then we have these two um, discs here, which have the symbol for day and night on the back. And this particular disc identifies the two ladies there as being two beautiful sisters who um, lived during the Three Kingdoms period, the period between the Han Dynasty, which finished in AD 220, and the beginning of the Tang in AD um, 618. And this character is not um, identified, but we've associate her with the Luo Shen Fu, who would have been living about the same time as these two sisters here. So when we redid the galleries, the main Asian galleries last year, it was decided for the first time to have a case featuring objects from the 20th century and another case featuring objects from the 21st century. And here we have the case for the 21st century, which includes some modern ceramics, a beautiful lacquer piece that was specially commissioned by the British Museum, and also a scholar's rock, uh, which would traditionally be rock, now made here of stainless steel. And the jade that I chose to buy for this particular case is a jade made by Yang Shi, who made the plaque, uh, the tall plaque that we saw in the jade gallery. And this is very beautifully done, and it's the picture of the Guan Yin, um, the goddess of compassion. And if you look to the side, you can see her eyebrow, her nose, her lips, her chin. And it's in paper cut fashion, which would be extremely difficult to have actually worked. And she's looking towards the lotus flower, which is the symbol of Buddhism.
I hope you will have enjoyed this very quick tour of the Chinese Jade Gallery. We're really happy and proud to be able to show today contemporary jades made by artists in China today to show that the reverence for Chinese jade is something that is still um, continuing even 8,000 years after jade began to be worked in China. And I hope you'll be able to come and see the Chinese jades for yourself and also to come into the main part of the Chinese Asian gallery and see the wonderful Chinese art that we have there too. Thank you.